It's just war. It's, it's no different than going to the store to buy a, some eggs. This, this was easy. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Dana Priest investigates the creation of Top Secret America. Tonight on Frontline, Top Secret America. Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. I'm Diane Sawyer, and it's Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. Just a few moments ago, something uh, believed to be a plane crashed into the South Tower. The world has crashed train. into one of the towers. It looks almost like a mushroom cloud. Trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating. Welcome back to Fox News. We have a very tragic alert for you right here. Something hit the Pentagon on the outside of the fifth court. On a day unlike any other in the long course of American history, a terrorist act of war against this country. President has been attacked. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. President Bush said to us in the basement of the White House on the night of 9-11, you have everything you need. And that was true, uh, because as soon as we went to the Congress, they said, just tell us what you need. Blank check. The president was determined to spend whatever was necessary and do whatever was necessary to conduct a new kind of war. The key to the new war would be secrecy. We'd have to work the dark side, if you will. We would have to spend time in the shadows and in the intelligence world. In the first few days, the entire blueprint for what would happen over the next decade was written, all in secret. The public didn't know, the media didn't know, and it would take us years to find out. For 10 years, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Dana Priest has reported on hidden military and intelligence operations. A lot of what needs to be done here will have to be done quietly without any discussion using sources and methods that are available to our team. In the beginning, we saw a little bit of this world everywhere, and we were gathering bit by bit. It's going to be vital for us to use any means at our disposal to achieve our objective. It really took years to figure out how big it really was, and we were shocked. CIA had already done more homework on al-Qaeda than any other part of the U.S. government. And so what they were able to do then was to put together a proposal and a timeline as far as how the CIA could be the, the vanguard of the U.S. government move against al-Qaeda. They just wanted no information out. I think the reality is that they wanted to keep it secret because they were doing things that a lot of people would not approve of and they wanted to do them as long as they could without being found out. That sets in motion a, the largest covert action program since the height of the Cold War, and many people inside the agency will say it's even larger than that. And a timeline as far as how the CIA could be the, the vanguard of the U.S. government. Victory in Afghanistan came so quickly, and the ball kept rolling in secret. And by and large, it's continued in secret. Greystone was underway well beyond the borders of Afghanistan. In more than a dozen countries, operatives were fighting a global secret war. It just begged so many questions. Is this assassination? You know, what rules are they operating under? Still, it raises a host of new questions. Does the director of central intelligence now have a James Bond-style license to kill? Drone attacks were only a part of Greystone. In Afghanistan, the military captured thousands, but some of the high-value terrorists disappeared. I know from the military people who were on the ground that not everybody was going into the military penal system. So where were they going? And what were they doing with them? Only later did Priest learn that Kofer Black and the CIA were using harsh techniques to extract information. Someone uses the term, well, these are called stress and duress techniques. And that sort of crystallizes stress and duress techniques. That doesn't sound like the military rules. 
In secret, the administration had authorized the CIA to use what they called enhanced interrogation techniques. And the enhanced interrogation techniques were a set of techniques that would work on someone uh, with slot to likely have information about a possible next imminent attack on the homeland. They can do a lot of things uh, that used to be considered torture. Waterboarding, for example, by any definition, it's torture. Justice Department called it enhanced interrogation methods and approved seven of them, including waterboarding. Al-Qaeda's Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was waterboarded 183 times. It took reporter Dana Priest years to piece together where prisoners like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed were. They had been hidden in a secret network of CIA prisons known as black sites. In the investigation of the black sites, I found a worldwide system of about two dozen prisons throughout the world run by the CIA, paid by the CIA, organized by the CIA, but with cooperation from other countries. Top CIA official John Rizzo helped authorize the prisons. Creating a prison system was something, certainly in my 25 years, we had never done. It was essential that these people be held in absolute isolation with, with access to the fewest number of people. That quickly led to the conclusion that that facilities had to be built overseas, secret facilities. For the first time, the White House had approved the building of an international prison system entirely in secret. The amount of secrecy is phenomenal. The desire and the willingness of government to operate in secret and to deny the public, the media, the basic facts about what they were doing was all inclusive. We were falling deeper and deeper into a secretly run government. And a timeline as far as how the CIA could be the, the vanguard of the U.S. government. The terrorist surveillance program authorized the NSA to intercept certain telephone calls and emails of American citizens without a warrant. The NSA created a global electronic dragnet capable of reaching into America's communication networks, capturing 1.7 billion intercepts every day. The National Security Agency has a huge vacuum cleaner around the world. Uh, and it is sucking down information from computer networks, from radios, from telephone calls, all over the world. So much information that no human being could ever go through it on a daily basis. Other basic challenge is in sorting through the huge volume of information. The analogy is not so much a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in a stack of needles. But finding the exact needle would take manpower, lots of it and in a hurry. The NSA turned to a new force in the covert war, private contractors. You had this boom in the corporate intelligence world as well. Companies like Khaki, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, just all the old fashioned industrial, we're building ships and submarines type corporations quickly moved into the intelligence and information space. The NSA spent billions of dollars on more than 480 private companies. Michael Hayden led the effort in the days right after 9-11. Uh, I did it at NSA, George did it at, at, at CIA, we all did it. It was a way to go out there and, and, and to get these capabilities into the flow infinitely more quickly than you would have been able to do had you gone through the, the government personnel system. In office parks near the NSA, Thousands of private contractors, many making much more money than federal employees, helped digest data. This war was not a war that required a lot of tanks, a lot of fighter jets. It required information, and information flows in a different way and is, is analyzed by machines. Exactly how much money the NSA was spending in the years after 9-11 is one of the government's most closely guarded secrets. 
the agency's budget, like its work, is a state secret. Well, have you actually looked at this building on a satellite map yet? No. It's gigantic. I mean, it's... it's In Vermont, and a reporter and former defense analyst, William Arkin, spent years trying to track the post-9-11 growth of America's hidden intelligence world. It's a government organization. It shows up nowhere. It's in a pizza parlor. It looks like it's a cover address. There's no defense organization there. I'll have to go look at it, or you'll have to go look at it. OK. Working with Dana Priest, the two would do what no one else had done, identify one by one the buildings and companies in what they called top secret America. Defense policy analysis, the defense program support, asymmetric warfare group, Project 7, the special security organization, CIA and FBI and NSA and all the other agencies. It took me about a year to complete a decent catalog of the government entities and corporate entities that work in this world. They discovered they were the only people in the country collecting such detailed information. The only way they could verify any of it was to go there in person. Two separate buildings. Hundreds of secret locations hiding in plain sight in office parks. This is a gate to the, to the NSA? Yeah, there's, a, there's a government facility back in there. You'll see it better after we turn down this road. Inside buildings like these, they launch drone strikes, gather and spread secret information, engage in cyber conflict. Titan in here, CSC is in one of these buildings, General Dynamics. So you really have the big mega firms, the giants of this whole industry here, Northrop right. Grumman. North Grumman. Boeing. With a security station here at the front where they, they check out the cars and look underneath. And... Yeah, that, so maybe you should put the camera down now. Because you just never know who's watching over here. All right, so should we just go over what you have? Sure. At the Washington Post, Priest and her team compiled what they found. This is the picture that I went up to that public parking lot and it was totally legal to be there. Is it For the rest of my life? I will never see the world the same way yeah. again, especially around Washington. Yeah. So had it not been for the leaves off the trees and at night, you, you just you would never see this thing. And yet it's gigantic. Yeah. These buildings that they might only be four stories high, but they go down 10 stories. And there's a whole world down there, like shops and places to eat that you don't know about. That's just for them. They had uncovered a new secret world that had grown up in the years after 9-11. If you could put the dots on the map, you had an alternative geography of the United States, a secret geography that is so important that guides how this country keeps itself safe, and yet it is not revealed um, to the public, even though it may be ne next to your back door. They didn't put it in one place. If they had, it would have been the size of the District of Columbia. Uh, what they did instead was scatter it around so it fits into the fabric of metropolitan Washington and on up into Baltimore, and it looks like commercial office space. Uh, huge new bureaucracy that you can't really see. Ten years after it began, an army of recruits continue to fight a war that was started in the shadows. There are close to a million people who are living in this different world, and there weren't a million before. Their numbers rival the active army, but we don't know what they're doing. We have a growing number of people who are doing things that you and I cannot know about. We can't know whether it works or not. And we don't know how much it costs. Every year, three dozen entirely new federal organizations, 1,900 private companies, billions and billions of dollars of waste, 17,000 locations. These are gigantic edifices that are going to stay here. This world is growing up behind the black wall.
timeline as far as how the CIA could be the, the vanguard of the U.S. government. The Bush administration national security team briefed the incoming national security team about that threat, and it was mentioned that perhaps they should consider canceling the inauguration. But all of top secret America was on hand to protect the president. What was happening behind the scenes was phenomenal. It was an unprecedented virtual security cocoon. We have the Intelligence Operations Center, Tactical Operations Center, and then we have our bomb technicians, our WMD experts, uh, our evidence response team. They used eye-in-the-sky satellites and hundreds of closed-circuit cameras. A lot of camera footage, a lot of live footage being fed into the command post. So everybody's looking at the crowds in real time. Everyone's looking at hot spots in real time. They watched the entrances into the city. Police and their technology were everywhere. You had license plate scanners all up and down the eastern seaboard on alert. You had sharpshooters out. They used the most exquisite technology. Sensors scattered around the city, picking up the wind, analyzing it every minute to see what's in it. And all of that information being fed in real time into the operations center. Everybody was watching and working, and it was like a crescendo. Everybody's anxiety level builds up. The phone calls are getting more and more phone calls. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. You, you can feel the tension in the air. Serve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And then you can see the collective sigh of release when the president was sworn in. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> The reports of the Somali threat turned out not to be true. But as the new president took office, there was an open question about the future of top secret America. On the campaign trail, candidate Obama had said it should be dramatically reined in. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. Barack Obama came in pledging a new era of transparency. My administration will take a top-to-bottom review of the threats we face and our ability to confront them. Too often, this administration's approach to homeland security has been to scatter money around and avoid hard choices. Now the president would be read into the classified programs, receiving daily briefings on threats to the homeland. He begins to get the intelligence brief. He begins to see the substance behind on the inner workings of government. You start getting reports about individuals. This known terrorist may be on the move from here to there. This known terrorist was intercepted talking about a planned attack. I think all of that, including what he had to go through in terms of a security briefing for the inauguration, um, influences then how he sees the threat and his own responsibility. It didn't take long for the new president to make clear where he stood. His people were, were signaling to us, I think partly to try to assure us that they weren't going to come in and dismantle the place, um, uh, that they were going to be just as tough, if not tougher, than the Bush people. No one in the Obama administration would talk to Frontline about top secret America. But the president had reauthorized almost all of the dark side operations. Greystone, the hunt for bin Laden and Al Qaeda, continued. Authorities were continued that were originally granted by President Bush beginning shortly after 9 11. Those were all picked up, reviewed, and endorsed by the Obama administration. In Afghanistan and Pakistan, Obama expanded the covert war against al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Most of the things that got started under Cover Black are still underway. Dramatically ramping up JSOC raids. Thousands have been captured and hundreds killed. They kept just about everything that has been going on since 9-11. They have taken the previous administration's 
drone war and run with it. They've increased the number of lethal drone attacks in Afghanistan and Pakistan many fold. He was persuaded this was both legal and effective, and he was going to increase the use of it, and he did so, frankly, very effectively. At home, the president decided to expand the growth of top-secret America. They've done nothing to roll it back. They've done very little to look inside of it to say, what is it that works, what doesn't work, what do we really need? And in this time of economic hardship, what don't we need? the president understood the political realities. There's going to be a terrorist strike someday. And when there is, if you've reduced the terrorism budget, the other party, whoever the other party is at the time, is going to say that you were responsible for the terrorist strike because you cut back the budget. And so it's a very, very risky thing to do. In his first year in office, the massive Department of Homeland Security began construction of their new $3.4 billion headquarters. It will rival the Pentagon as the largest government complex ever built in Washington. And DHS has continued a nationwide spending spree, sending billions of dollars to state and local police. What DHS wants to do is to turn all of the local and state law enforcement personnel into the tipsters for the FBI, into the frontline foot soldiers looking for possible terrorists. DHS funded high-tech terrorism centers around the country. Every state has at least one. There's 74 fusion centers in the United States. Contractors went in put in the large flat screen TVs, put in the mission control to the moon kind of uh, facilities. Now, state and local police are using surveillance cameras, biometric scanners, high-tech license plate readers. The software with the system, when it sees what it thinks is a, a license plate, it will read it using OCR, optical character recognition, and make a cross-check against a database while it's been a high-tech bonanza for the states, there are questions about its effectiveness. You can look, if you're objective, at all of this money and all of this effort and say, what would have happened if we hadn't done that? And in almost every case, nothing would have happened. It's true that there hasn't been another attack. It's not true that all of this expenditure and all of these people have stopped it and a timeline as far as how the CIA could be the, the vanguard of the U.S. government 